introduce Sean Archibeck. Sean is an Associate Professor of Ruminant Nutrition in the Department of Animal Sciences at Colorado State University. He's, he uh, was a co-developer in the original Conservation Innovation Grant for NAXAT, but then he led the second Conservation Innovation Grant where we updated NAXAT. And he's also continuing to help with the training and further development and refinement of the NAXAT system. So with that, Sean, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Greg, for the introduction. Um, I'm now going to give you an overview of how we would actually use the NAXAT for this type of process without belaboring how to actually fill out the NAXAT in the first place, which, as mentioned before, has been covered in other uh, conversations and other webinars previously. So for today's demonstration, we're going to be focusing on a dairy demonstration. Um, there's nothing magical or in particular why we chose dairy. It just um, gives us a nice overview of how the system would work. So as mentioned before, the producer or the planner would go through and answer the, the typical survey types of questions about the facility, and they would end up getting their final score. Okay. At this point, they'll, they'll have their baseline um, score here where they can see, as mentioned, the, they may have practices where they are not doing so well. They have a lot of room for improvement, which is shown with a large amount of white. Or they may have an area where it shows that they're doing some really good things and they have a lot of green filling in. Now, this doesn't mean, as mentioned before, that they're not uh, producing emissions in those categories. It just means that in that facility with their infrastructure, that they are meeting all the management opportunities they have to manage that emission at that point. So using these NAXAT results, what we're going to do and how we're going to start is we're going to have to decide what are we actually interested in. Okay, So we'll have to look at each um, air quality resource concern, whether it's emissions of particulate matter and uh, particulate matter precursors, or maybe there in your particular area there's a concern over ozone emissions or ozone precursor emissions, um, objectionable odors, greenhouse gases, whatever it happens to be for your particular area. And that's one of the things that's relatively unique about this was when it was developed, the idea was that the we recognized as a development team that different areas and different regions of the country would have different concerns and priorities when it came to air quality management. And as previously mentioned, um, there's quite often trade-offs that are going to happen. And we knew that going into this, and that was part of the plan, was so that a producer could see the potential trade-offs that would happen with a mitigation plan that they may try to implement. And at least that way, people are, un are at least somewhat aware of these unintentional consequences that may come with their actions. So let's start off. If somebody is interested in particulate matter or a particular matter resource, they're going to want to focus on the score bars for both particulate matter, which is going to be focused primarily on dust, as well as ammonia, which is going to be a precursor for some of our very fine particulate matter. Um, now, within particulate matter, to help focus your efforts, you're going to want to spend most of the time looking at your score bars for animals and housing, on-farm roads, manure storage, primarily if dry manure is what's being managed. If it's a wet manure system, obviously that's probably not going to have a huge impact there. Um, land application, again, if dry manure is what's being managed. And then lastly, feed and water, but only that if dry feed ingredients are either stored or mixed on site. For ammonia, we're going to want to focus on feed and water manure storage, land application, animals and housing, and collection and transfer. So if we come back here and we look at our slide and use that, that little rubric to kind of highlight the areas that we're looking at, we'll look and we'll see that here we have 
the highlighted boxes either in red or in yellow here that we just this won't happen on NACSET. This is just for demonstration purposes. Where the boxes that we're going to want to be focused on here in ammonia and over here in particulate matter. And so obviously the ones that are highlighted in red, those are the ones that are going to be our, our real high priorities. And then the ones that are highlighted here in yellow, these are ones that we're going to probably want to go back as a secondary concern, uh, particularly if they have a really low score like we're seeing here where we have almost completely white boxes showing that there's a huge amount of uh, potential for improvement in our management of those systems. Now, as we move along, okay, let's say we were interested in ozone precursors. Then we're going to be look, focusing on volatile organic compounds. So in this case, uh, we're going to be focused here on this final column here and looking at these bars over here to influence our ozone precursors using our, vol our volatile organic compounds. Um, within the VOC category, our big focus areas where we're going to have a large bang for our buck is going to be to focus on manure storage, feed and water, or animals and housing, and particularly looking at which ones of those we may have some lower scores in. So in this example, I'm probably going to spend a lot of my time and effort looking at manure storage or animals and housing. Feed and water, it looks like the producer in this situation, the scenario that we're running, may, is probably making some really good decisions. Not a lot of room for improvement here in feed and water. You're probably going to want to spend most of your time looking at those other sections. Okay. Now, if it's the producer has a odor resource concern, their focus is going to be on score bars for odor, all the organic compounds, hydrogen sulfide, and ammonia. Now, again, within each of those, obviously, there's going to be some uh, key re areas that we're going to want to focus on. So within odor, we're probably going to want to spend most of our time focused on score bars for mortalities, manure storage, and feed and water. Other, other categories that will, are likely also going to be key contributors to that odor production are going to be land application and animals and housing. Within the volatile organic compound section, we'll want to focus on the score bars for manure storage, feed and water, and animals and housing. For hydrogen sulfide, we're going to want to spend some time looking at manure storage and feed and water. And then with ammonia, again, we're going to want to spend our time looking at feed and water, manure storage, land application, animals and housing, and collection and transfer. So as you can see, that's going to highlight a lot of these, um, these bars that we're going to want to look at and look a little bit more carefully at as we go through here. And again, we've highlighted the ones that we definitely want to look at in red, and then also highlighted in yellow are likely contributors that we may want to go back and look at as well, particularly if there was a really large um, room for improvement in those areas. Okay. Now, if the producer has a greenhouse gas resource concern, the primary areas where they would want to focus are on methane or nitrous oxide. And this brings up a really good example here where you can see in the scenario that we're running that the producer has a lot of NAs in their nitrous oxide uh, column, as well as other places throughout the, um, the their score bars. Now, this isn't an indication that the producer or somebody made a mistake when they were filling out the NACSAT tool. This is where, as a group of scientists, at the end of the day, we felt that in these particular areas, there wasn't an adequate body of literature for us to be talking about what the ultimate impacts of some of these practices were going to be on nitrous oxide production. So if you see those NAs, that's an area where hopefully in our future um, programs we're going to have some room for improvement. So within methane, 
if we're worried about greenhouse gas concerns. Our big areas to focus on are going to be in manure storage, feed and water, and within nitrous oxide, we're going to want to focus on the score bars for feed and water, manure storage, and land application. So these are the boxes that are highlighted here. Obviously, the ones with an NA there, we're not, it's not going to be a lot that we could actually do to change those scores. But that's going to still leave us three areas where we can go back and start looking at potential ways to improve the management of those resources in those areas. All right, so now I'm going to run you through a real brief example. And we're in this example, we're using a Western dairy. And there's no non-attainment issues that are, that are going on. But in this particular situation, they're starting to receive some odor complaints. And the producers decided this is an area they want to address. So rather than make you scroll back through the, the slides and try and figure out what were the important boxes, I highlighted them here again for our odor. Okay, now remember this is going to be probably one of our most complex um, areas that we're going to look at. But I've highlighted our key areas here, um, including our volatile organic compounds, hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, and then of course odor, where we tried to incorporate all, all those components together. Now, within that odor category, we see that we have food and water highlighted as well as manure storage and mortalities. Those are going to be our, our primary areas. And then we're also going to be interested in looking at animals and housing and land application practices that could also influence that odor production. Now, also in there, I've highlighted here in red these bars that have less than 50% of, of the area filled in with green. So those are areas where the, obviously there's a large room for improvement. So within those, we see that across the board, we've kind of got this issue somewhere here in manure storage. Additionally, up in feed and water, we have a, a pretty big influence on odor production, maybe less of an impact than some of the others. But that, that shows that those are two areas that we probably want to go back and look at and run our copied new session in. Okay, So if we go back and we start looking through the feed and water questions that were asked, in the original survey. We're going to start scrolling through here and we're going to see eventually that we've got a situation where the producer has indicated that water is supplied to their animals uh, with overflow waters, okay, where they're going to be seasonal and they're going to run continuously. And that's something that we figure is probably not going to be the ideal option here. So we want to test and see what the influence on our on, on this practice is going to be. So instead of using those overflow waters, we're going to go back, change the answer to uh, stock tanks or a circulating tank. And at that time, now you're going to see here in this odor category for feed and water, we went from having less than 50% management of the odor coming out of the feed and water management. To almost all of that is now being met. So that would say that in this particular dairy situation, there's probably a good, a good reason to be looking at altering their water provision system. Now that doesn't address the manure storage, so that's something we're going to have to come back to. So we'll go back into the tool, start looking at the answers that we chose there. We see that we've got a, a place that's not hauling manure daily. They're, um, Wash water is being separated from manure. And we go through, and as we start looking at how the manure is actually being stored, we're looking for something that really jumps out at us. And one of the things that we're going to see here is now, all of a sudden, we're starting to look at the manure storage structures. They don't have any cover here. So that might be something we want to look at as we move down through here. And we see that their manure storage structure, they have all these different options that they could have done, but they didn't at this particular time, weren't using any options there. So now we, the 
the producer is interested in potentially looking at a permeable cover, whether it's straw, stocks, geotextile materials, anything like that, as a potential way to help mitigate emissions from that manure storage. We go, we select that, and we see that we did make some improvement here. We're now above that 50% um, area, so we're starting to get to where we're making some good impact on that manure storage emissions. So we're looking right here where I'm pointing with the green arrow okay, across the board. But there's still a lot of room for improvement. It wasn't nearly as big of an improvement as we saw in feed and water, but definitely it's getting us above that kind of fit at half of the management decisions uh, impacting that, that resource concern. All right. So at, at the end of the day, that leaves us with two possible solutions that we could look at changing on this dairy um, that would have at least enough of an impact on the odor emissions to where they're going to be mitigating at least 50% of what they could be managing um, and maybe even more so with that feed and water change. So the final options here would be to change the waterers or they could go back and look at changing how they're covering um, their manure storage systems. Okay. <clears throat> so now the question would be what types of practices or what practices from NRCS are actually going to be applicable to, the, to these different situations? Now, ideally, the, what we want people to be doing from NRCS is to obviously use the NRCS National Air Quality initiative matrix for the overall list of practices with air quality purposes. Uh, now there's a smaller subset, and we're going to go through those in just a second, um, that are specific to confinement-based livestock and poultry systems. And those are ones that we're, we're going to want to spend a lot of time focused on. Okay. So within those, we have the air quality practices that we'd want to be looking at First one's air filtration and scrubbing. Obviously, this is going to be, some of these are going to apply only in very particular situations. They may not all apply. Okay. Um, amendments for treatment of agricultural waste, 591. Anaerobic digester, 366. Animal mortality facility, 316. Composting facility, 317. Dust control from animal operations on open lot surfaces, 375. Dust control on unpaved roads and surfaces, 373. Feed management, 592. Heavy use area protection, 561. Nutrient management, 590. Um, roofs and covers, 367. Waste separation facility, 632. Waste treatment, 629. Um, uh, Windbreak Shelter Belt Establishment, 380. Windbreak Shelter Belt Renovation, 650. And one of the things that we tried to do in here uh, with, the, with the NAC set is when you're on your results page and you're at your final results page, we put links, if you click on those actual boxes where you have your 50% green or whatever, um, is that it should direct you to the PDF at the NR NRCS site for those particular practices. We've had a little bit of trouble with these, so at this time I would say still go back and consult the, the actual matrix for these practices, um, but currently we're trying to guide um, the, the user to the particular practices that may apply in, the, in their area. Now we recognize that all these different practices may not be available or applicable in every state or every situation, but we give all the potential options and then we're counting on the, the agents to actually know what is applicable in their particular region. Okay. Additionally, we have this um, on the NRC, on the NACSAT page, we have a list to all of our resources. And there are many different resources that can help the, the producer or the agent that's helping with this um, assessment that could also be used in conjunction with NACSAT. And these include things like the AMPAT, the 
error management practices assessment tool. And we go through there and we link, provide a series of links that will take you to other applicable and very useful um, websites that would help with, with deciding these final management decisions. Okay. And last but not least, we also uh, would point people towards the webinars that show on how to actually use the tool on the front end, which are highlighted in the LPE Learning Center, and the air quality on animal in eextension.org, and the web link is there. And that is all I have for you today.